Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning, everybody, and a welcome to Durian and ASEAN. This is Grace, and then today is Friday, and I hope everyone is awake. <laughs> well, this is the last day of this week, and um, we are still delivering the news from Southeast Asia as well as from Malaysia as well. So why not starting with the Malaysia news, which is quite significant. Which will be happening on the 21st of April, um, which is the ASEAN uh, People's Forum. In fact, it's not only the ASEAN People's Forum, but then also we have lots of other events and the conferences this coming up week. And what what will happen and what we can expect is there will be around 1,400 participants to attend this annual civil society conferences, uh, which will be on the April 21st, and it's on Tuesday. And um, uh, according to uh, one of the uh, organizers, it was said that uh, they were pretty much overwhelmed by the response, and then they had to close registration uh, as they had to reach their limit. So, 1,400 participants is a lot of uh, numbers for the this particular conference, and also it's it is going to be a very incredible gathering of civil society organizations. Uh, of course, activities will be there international agencies and uh, government representatives from the, across Southeast Asia. So a lot of um, prominent figures will be there on that day. And also, it has to be made sure that there will, will be a plenty of constructive dialogue on the concerns of ASEAN especially. And uh, the, one of the, um, uh, the, the key note uh, from the, the, this event is that the, the former Prime Minister, Tun Abdullah Hamad Badawi, will be delivering the keynote address. And also, um, oh, there is a chairman of Berse 2.0, which is Maria Chin Abdullah, who is also part of the, the ASEAN People's Forum, or APF, uh, 2015, organizing committee. And according to her, she said, it is very symbolic uh, for Abdullah to speak this year uh, because he actually helped to organize the, the first civil uh, ASEAN Civil Society Conference in Malaysia. So... Uh, hopefully that we, uh, he can share his thoughts on whether ASEAN uh, has become more people-centered uh, in the past 10 years. In fact, uh, this year ASEAN, uh, the focus of ASEAN, especially for Malaysia, is people-centered ASEAN, so also to bring the awareness of ASEAN. So hope that these all those um, the objectives of the ASEAN this year could be achieved. And um, this is a very important uh, uh, event, mainly also because there will be on, uh, other uh, keynotes and also presenters that uh, will be there on that day. And um, this session will include uh, Children Matter, creating a community of CSO, CSOs in ASEAN for children rights, strengthening women's political participation in the conflict and post-conflict situations in ASEAN, as well as to, to discuss and also share the ideas on the refugees in ASEAN. And so it is uh, just time is TikToking, and that the although the registration is already closed, uh, there will be after interviews or uh, even after the, the articles will come up. So expect and uh, let's hope for the best. So moving on to the uh, a few other news. This is regarding ASEAN. Um, uh, I'm sorry, this is regarding Malaysia, but then um, a lot of other countries outside of Malaysia has shown their concerns over this Sedition Act. Well, we have reported and also did commentary on the, the amendment on the Sedition Act in Malaysia. So, first of all, EU on the recently adopted uh, the amendment to the Sedition Act in Malaysia, they actually said that 
they are the a strong advocator of the human rights in ASEAN. So, for example, such as the death penalty and the freedom of expressions. So they actually uh, expressed that uh, Malaysia had decided to strengthen, strengthen the Sedition Act instead of repealing it as previously announced. This can have implication for the exercise of freedom of expressions as demonstrated by recent controversial instances of application of the Act. In fact, the Sedition Act has applied to many, many Malaysians, as well as we could actually see in a few cases from um, Singapore as well. And this is uh, a, a problem and an issue. It has become one of the controversial issues in Malaysia especially. And the image of Malaysia to EU or the other countries has um, um, has shown otherwise. Uh, and also that uh, as a friend to Malaysia according to EU, they also recalls that the respect for human rights and also fundamental freedom and the trust in due process are essential tenets of all this democratic system. And this is underprinting growth and the prosperity and also the harmony wise. So these concerns are all coming all the way from EU and as well as the US, which I'll be talking about a bit later. And this under uh, the federal constitution, the attorney general has uh, a, um, a prerogative and also discretionary powers to bring about the criminal charges against anyone. And they can also vary the charges, a man for drop them altogether without giving any reason. And also the court um, can hold the AG accountable uh, on the exercise for uh, this power. Such powers are not actually uh, it's not necessary and also, also unfettered and also AG can be held and accountable if there is abuse of such powers. This amendment to the Sedition Act basically have led to the question being raised on the various charges that many are facing under this previous version of this act. And also uh, the lawyers, uh, they're familiar with the Sedition Act, are of course, they are urging the Attorney General to drop the charges against the numerous people who have been actually charged under the Sedition Act several times. This is actually um, creating another problem. And in fact, all the way from U.S., the Washington, uh, the U.S. Uh, State Department, in cautioning the Protojaya on the amendment on the Sedition Act, pointing out that uh, the public debate was the best protection against intolerance, hatred, and in strengthening democracy. So, in fact, that like I mentioned, they also shown the uh, the concerns over the Sedition Act. And the question here is, should um, the U.S. actually push stronger towards the Malaysian government to um, to rectify or even to condemn the Sedition Act amendment. The USA statement, in fact, uh, notes the uh, April 10th passage of the amendment to Malaysian Sedition Act, and they also are um, very worried about the restrictions on the freedom of expression. So both uh, EU and USA, they do respect and also to uh, appreciate the expressions, freedom of expressions in certain countries. And it looks like because of the amendment, because of the, the strengthening the Sedition Act, it looks like the freedom of expression in Malaysia is getting lesser and lesser, even though Malaysia is said that it, um, the system, the government system is practiced on the, the democratic system. And also, uh, U.S. said uh, they welcome the decision to remove the provisions uh, outlawing criticism of the government and the judiciary. And they also hope the government of Malaysia will therefore reconsider the recent sedition charges brought under those uh, now defunct sedition the law. So uh, other aspects of the Sedition Act Amendment, however, it th actually threatens to, to restrict unduly speech and also the public discourse, particularly worrying our new provisions that increase penalties, including the, for the first time offenders as well, and also could make sharing uh, eligibly seditious material on social media, especially and on the crime. So uh, this little, um, perhaps the little negative comment on social media 
you never know. It could also be charged on the sedition hand, and it already has happened before. So. It has become more cautious things about it, and also the public debate of ideas can be among the best protections against the intolerance. It's just like the other um, the organization, including EU, said. Um, but how do we actually open the debate uh, to the public to to participate regarding this Sedition Act? Because after the amendment has already already been made, and when the if the p debate is on, wouldn't that actually create a more controversial issue? Well, there are also other amendments to the act where the state inciting hatred, contempt, or even dissatisfaction against the government or the administrations of justice in Malaysia. Uh, there would actually no longer be a uh, considered seditious as well. So those are the few facts and a few actually uh, I will call it reality in uh, Malaysia that all those uh, public and the Malaysians have been facing uh, regarding of this sedition act. Uh, however, the all those concerns uh, from US and EU, they have actually shown the strongly uh, and expressively towards the, this amendment to the sedition act in Malaysia. So uh, we'll take a short break here, and then uh, when we return, we'll bring more news from Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Welcome back. This is Grace. And of course, you are with us again on our ASEAN Daily. So Grace, from Sedition Act, we have to move on to business. Right. <laughs> okay. When we talk about business, of course, the biggest uh, competitor right now is not the US or China. The biggest competitor for the ASEAN market right now will be... All will the be, way from? <laughs> all, will be and is currently <laughs> going to be <laughs> Russia. A lot of people might not think that Russia... Russia is also a very huge country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we think about uh, the, the biggest share of market in Southeast Asia to be dominated, of course, we think about India, China, Australia, uh, the US, but or even EU, but seldom people even talk about Russia. But... Um, recently, Russia has been uh, visiting countries in Southeast Asia and forming partnership. They have been investing heavily in terms of infrastructure investment and trade investment in countries within Southeast Asia. In fact, they are aiming to have double trade, <laughs> mm. especially the countries from ASEAN like Thailand and Indonesia. And then they have been, uh, in, uh, they are going to invest a huge amount of money, which will be like 10 and 5 billion dollars, respectively, uh, next year, in fact. And also they are looking forward to, to work with the Vietnam as well. So this uh, sort of the agreements were signed to upgrade, uh, we're talking about the Vietnam the investment here, the Vietnamese power plant, as well as just supplied Hanoi with the uh, Sukhoi's uh, sub project in the super jet and the 100 aircraft uh, and then the railroad carts. See, they, so are, they are actually quite good in uh, technology mm -hmm. and, and infrastructure in the sense that they have super jet. <laughs> <laughs> they have super jet and then they also have a nuclear power. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> We they shouldn't do. miss that as well. And um, <coughs> it is actually very ambitious plan of coming from Russia to deal with the Southeast Asian countries. A lot of people are asking, like, why Southeast Asia and why now? But a lot of people might not realize that the sanction imposed by uh, on Russia by EU and the US uh, is one of the main reason um, that the Ru that Russia has been having this look Southeast Asia policy, <laughs> and what we are seeing right now, the Ukraine crisis is the reason why Russia is seeing that they are not going to make any time soon friends with EU or the US. So what we are seeing right now is as it is an expanding of trade, ties and investment uh, in Southeast Asia. They are starting to diversify all these different uh, trade uh, agreements in Southeast Asian countries. In fact, statement was made during Russia Prime Minister Dmitry Met Vedev <laughs> recent visit in the region of Southeast Asia underlining uh, Russia's intention to fight for a share of the ASEAN market with, of course, uh, together with the US and China. I think Russia would do well because 
uh, so far we do not have any Russian investment as strongly as what we mm. see with Chinese and the US investment. Yeah, and uh, there are a few advantages, in fact, coming from the Russia to work with uh, uh, the countries from ASEAN countries, which is, first, they are very open to entire uh, organization or we say market to, to their partners. And secondly, they can also offer the fuel and energy corporations. And uh, with Russia will be interesting for many countries actually. Mm -hmm. So those are, the <coughs> those are the few advantages that mm -hmm. the Russia can bring in terms of relations and also trade markets. Mm -hmm. You mentioned just now Russia's investment in Vietnam, mm -hmm. but I would like to mention other countries as well, uh, besides Vietnam and of course Indonesia as well, is Thailand. Uh -huh. uh, so Russia, Prime Minister, went to Thailand uh, just recently earlier this month to sign agreement with the government uh, of um, uh, Thailand, Prayut Chan On Cha, to cooperate in energy sector and supply of Again, Sukhok Superjet 100 planes and uh, uh, the Kamas trucks, as well as the use of Thai capital for the construction of uh, by Russia of a railway. This one is in Indonesia, Kalimantan. And in turn, the Thai have managed to negotiate the expansion of the supply of their agricultural products to Russia. So in a way, it's a win-win situation. It's like I give, I'm giving you my expertise, which is mainly agriculture for the Southeast Asian side and manufacturing, while for the Russia side, it's more towards technology and uh, towards infrastructure, which is badly needed in Southeast Asia. And in addition to that, guess who else? wants to join and participate to, to work with Russia. Oh my god, is it Korea? It's South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so actually they have shown their interest uh, to intend to participate along with uh, Russia in the consumption uh, the, the project in the North Korean special economic zone of this uh, particular uh, so uh, area. Wait, North April. Korea or South Korea? It's South Korea. They but intend to the project is in North Korea. The project will be in North Korean Special Economic Zone. Wow. So it's called so called the April Ambitions. So, so you see, your your people are making friends with <laughs> North Koreans. Well, so I guess we could work together. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think what is interesting here is uh, the criticism towards Russia's entry uh, in the ASEAN market because uh, there are analysts that are questioning if is Russia strong enough com in comparison with the West to engage meaningfully in terms of trade and investment in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia because even Russia, its economy... Although it's, it's uh, I mean, in terms of power, it's quite strong, but economically, it's still not as strong as the US or even China. So that's the part that Russia needs to fix in a way that it can add meaningful uh, value, uh, I would say, supply and chain value as well as trade value mm. to Southeast Asia. So anytime soon, we might be waiting for vodka and what else that is Russian? <laughs> well, um, that's coming from Malaysia, <laughs> <laughs> but then it hasn't said anything with Malaysia yet. Mm -hmm. But we are hoping to, you know, not only Indonesia or Thailand or Vietnam, but also most of uh, part of ASEAN countries can de deal with uh, Russia or even other gi gigantic countries. Mm -hmm. Then we can, you know, uh, get the benefits and as well as exchange a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. So from Russia... We go to something that is even much more <laughs> scarier than Russia's entry to uh, ASEAN country, but uh, I'm but I'm talking about uh, a bank. And yeah. It's not any other bank. It's a China-backed bank. It's called the ASEAN Invest uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. It is the um, China's version of uh, ADB or ASEAN Development Bank by Japan and or the world. Uh, will bang by the US. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it seems like countries are set, I mean, huge countries, uh, big brothers countries are setting up banks as a front for the, their geopolitical war. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I won't say war, but I would say geopolitical power or stance in the global arena. Yeah, and in fact, uh, <coughs> China, the bank that you mentioned, um, ha now has like 57 economics that have signed up to be founding members. And a lot of them mm -hmm. are countries from EU. Some of them are close allies of the US. Mm. And of course, all 10 countries of ASEAN are members of the AIIB 
uh, bank. Yes, and including the 13 of G20 nation as well. In fact, the final list is bigger than the previously anticipated mm. as seven more countries that includes Israel, South Africa, and uh, as well, Jen, Iceland, Portugal, <laughs> Sweden, and Poland. Guess which country that is absent? Japan uh, and South Korea. Korea. <laughs> <laughs> when I, but Japan is showing interest. In fact, it will decide, I think, uh, by next two months uh, in June, whether they want to join the ASEAN Infrastructure Investment Bank or not. Uh, this is based on a report by Kyoda News. Mm-hmm. In, it's a Tokyo-based newspaper. So, anyway, what is your thought on the AIIB? Well, this is definitely very... Uh, huge project coming from China because uh, AIIB, if I may call like this, that aims to <coughs> improve the infrastructure and also to generate the profits from the investment and also to coordinate the relationship uh, among the other member economics. Mm-hmm. And then that's also uh, one of the top priorities mm-hmm. that the AIIB is having. But rega- uh, the, but the regards with uh, shared holding, that uh, the oldest people that have been involved or members who have been involved, they need to really uh, focus focus on what's more important here mm-hmm. by joining this uh, bank or or sort of like uh, collaborating with this bank. I noticed that it's so attractive that every country is. now is considering to join, yeah. of course, except for the US. <laughs> but the bank itself is saying that it is a complementary to the ASEAN Development Bank and it's not a competition to the World Bank. Mm. So I guess we have to wait and see whether it's true or not. Uh, with ASEAN Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, the focus will be more on ASEAN, right. obviously. In fact, uh, it, it is estimated that ASEAN economies, which would include Southeast Asia, would hold around 75% stake at the beginning, uh, at which would result in China only have a 28% shareholding stake in right. its own bank. Mm-hmm. That, that's interesting that it it's seeing it is seeing its potential in developing ASEAN as a whole, including Southeast Asia. My question here is, Eileen, how will there be will they be uh, transparent when everything is formed, policies are made, regulation is there? So how transparent can they be when it comes to you know uh, policies or dealing with other countries? Because like we mentioned, there are so many members mm-hmm. they want to be part of this. Mm-hmm. But another question that we also need to ask, has the ADB and World Bank be extremely mm-hmm. transparent in the past? Mm-hmm. I think each bank uh, has to be transparent at certain level. But the obvious, uh, I think, f- uh, yeah, the obvious, uh, I guess, foundation right. of this bank mm-hmm. is, uh, of course, it's supposed to be funding and uh, for infrastructure and supposed to be a good source mm-hmm. of uh, infrastructure construction, uh, construction financing. But at the same time, we also need to acknowledge geopolitically, it is is supposed to carry the agenda and interest of the country origin of that particular bank. So in a way, it is. I, I think it would be as transparent right. as World Bank and a ASEAN Development Bank. But at the same time, we cannot uh, not just just be blinded by yeah. their geopolitical interest. Right. And on another hand, talking about the AIIB again. So for us Southeast Asian, we are quite. Uh, I would say fortunate in a way because we have the luxury of being neutral. Mm. But countries that are close allies with the US would be a bit uh, problematic on this. And I'm talking about Australia. (laughs) So uh, apparently when Australia signed uh, the AIIB uh, to be part of its membership, uh, it is caught in the middle of the US-China power tussle, Mm. interestingly. So the, there is a tension actually between the United States and, and China over this um, uh, as, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And then Australia is just stuck there now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it is actually concerned. It is a concern which is arising from these negotiations for all this TPP and also for uh, Australia. They have this key focus which is to have the, the better foreign policies and also to how to balance this economic ties with China and its cultural ties with the, the US. Mm-hmm. And what is interesting is uh, of course with Australia they are also a sign, uh, I mean, they also 
they are also signing the TPP. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will be. And of course, now we are seeing that Australia is caught in the middle between pro-US um, sort of uh, agreement as well as pro-China agreements. And as, uh, Australia's vision for the TPP uh, lies in developing the regional architecture and provide uh, to provide a viable gateway to the entire of Asia Pacific. And in short, they are looking at exploiting the unrestricted multilateral agreement. But for the U.S. vision of the TPP, mm-hmm. it's supposed to be establishing bilateral agreements in this region uh, to focus on developing further PTAs uh, with countries that it hasn't already partnered with. Well, that's the reason why China is excluded in it, mm. uh, because for fear that Beijing, uh, the, the trade deal, uh, I mean, for fear that U.S. dominance in this region will get lesser and lesser. So how should Australia uh, uh, react to this, or how should they function between the, the U.S. and then China? Can, uh, should they just be an act as a bridge, or should they be a sort of like a... Uh, meet a person to... to That's the question. Even Japan and uh, South Korea is Mm. trying to find a voice in it because they are also caught in the middle being uh, a pro-US ally. But at the same time, they know that if they don't uh, ride in the bandwagon of China, they will lose out on a huge economic pie. Mm -hmm. I think that is the the side of Australia that I see... I can see Prime Minister Tony Abbott is concerning on. But from the side of US and China, what they are what is you know i think the reality that we need to acknowledge is is the geopolitical struggle of which con- uh, which country will be dominating the global uh, political scene in in the coming years and of mm-hmm. course for us as for, for australia to remain neutral it will only uh, further deteriorate and increase the tension between those uh, country of US and China so apparently neutrality won't appease either party I think Australia should just you know stay quiet stay quiet <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean maybe because Malaysia has always been neutral in our foreign policy that is true so mm-hmm. I think if Australia you know would say something that would hurt the feeling of the US or China, it will only cause a major blow to their own foreign policy. But Australia always, like, unlike Malaysia, uh-huh. they have always been a pretty vocal. And then with this situation, it's pretty much awkward situation they are in at the moment between China it's and US. It's actually awkward because yeah. Australia has been quite I think in terms of global politics, they have been quite uh, neutral mm-hmm. and they have been getting it quite easy. easy. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have a strong relationship with China since it's situated in the Asia-Pacific and they have no problem with, with the US right. since forever. And mm-hmm. of course, they are close ally with the UK since the Queen is their Queen as well. <laughs> <laughs> but the AIIB proves to be, I guess, the could be the deal breaker. Mm. Yeah. I guess it needs to Australia really needs to be cautious mm. <laughs> and also need to take care to avoid the the stepping on any, you know, a uh, little bit of sensitive or controversial between uh China and the USA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, um just to uh end our show today, I just I, w- I would like to give a bit of um, a breaking news about Malaysian ringgit. <laughs> Our ringgit is so damn cheap now that yes. Singaporeans are rushing for to buy our ringgit as dollar hit a new high. <laughs> yes, dollar is increasing, but then Malaysian ringgit is dropping again and again, which is quite sad. Um, actually, a one Singapore uh, dollar can buy around two ringgit. <laughs> and more. More and two point seven two actually. Yeah. It's almost three now. Almost three now. That's crazy. Nobody's going to Singapore now. I think this is one of the weakest Malaysian ringgit that it has ever been mm-hmm. uh, um, since 1981. Can you believe that? <laughs> I I just want to cry because <laughs> that means no more Singapore trip. <laughs> Singaporeans will be rushing to Kuala Lumpur, you know, for all the seals. Oh no, <laughs> we can't have a Singaporean to conquer Malaysia yet. <laughs> I think tourism will be a boom for Malaysia yeah. in the, for for having a weak do, uh, a weak ringgit. But I think in the future, um, I can foresee that Malaysians won't be happy about it because a weaker ringgit means that you 
can't study overseas, you can't uh, have your usual, you know, Southeast Asian trip or overseas trip. So something that governments need to address because you do not want to offend the middle class in Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, but guess what happened? Just to add a little bit of examples to this, uh, dropping the Malaysian ringgit, is one of Malaysians who lives in Singapore, right? Mm -hmm. He works and he changed the thousand Singaporean dollars mm -hmm. just to pay for his car and house loan in Johor. Wow. So that's how much he can afford to change by changing the Singaporean dollars to Malaysian. It's so much worth it. <laughs> So are you saying that we should all work in Singapore now? No, it's 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 gonna be overpopulated. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's all from us today. Uh, I hope you enjoy our news commentary, and you can always uh, engage with us uh, with us via our Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, and of course, you can listen to our podcast at, on YouTube. And don't forget to visit our main channel, which is our website, durianasian.com, and we will be very welcoming your feedbacks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, catch up with, uh, with us in a bit at 9 o'clock for our Durian... Sorry, it's not Durian Hit today, right? Anything can it's happen anything Friday. Anything can happen Friday. Right.